Hey guys, welcome to Finally Clicked, the podcast where we discuss business, leadership, and personal development. My name is Margaret Smith, and I'm the Director of Operations for Pickett Street Properties, a real estate team out of Bothell, Washington. And I'll be here every week with our owner and team leader, Jesse D. Moore. We'll be digging into concepts and ideas that have helped us both personally and professionally. And you'll also get a chance to hear from local and national experts that we know provide massive value to get to the point where it all finally clicks. Hi, guys. Welcome to Finally Clicked with Margaret Smith and Jesse Moore. Uh, today, we have an exciting new addition to the podcast. Mm -hmm. It's our first interview. Yes. This is huge. It's huge. It's huge. It's, it's, it's huge. <laughs> it's going to be huge. huge. Like it's China. It's huge. And it's appropriate that it's Iris Scott. It's just appropriate. Margaret, who is <laughs> Iris Scott? <laughs> All right, you guys, if you're at your computer or if you're not, remember this for later, iriscottfineart.com. Go there and start browsing through her work as you listen. She is a finger painter from uh, Maple Valley, Washington, and Jesse's going to tell you a little bit more about how we met her. So I, in 2012, I bought a house with big walls, big blank walls. And uh, aesthetic is important to me. I like I like design. I like controlling my space. I like to make my home my sanctuary. And um, I wanted to be inten intentional on this home that I wanted an original piece of artwork from a local artist. And the problem is I'm super picky. And so I looked for probably nine months until one Sunday morning. I'm surprised it wasn't 18 months. Nine months. It was half the time for some reason. <laughs> and uh, one Sunday morning, I tripped across a painting by Iris Scott. And I knew right away that I wanted one of her pieces in my in my home. And so I did something that was kind of crazy for me. I never thought about doing it before. And in seeing her artwork and her style... And then looking at a picture of the ranch I grew up on, I realized I really wanted to see her recreate my childhood memories, you know, on this ranch, a picture of the ranch in her style. Mm -hmm. And so I sent her a picture and I said, you don't know me. I've never done this before. If I were to commission you to paint this picture, you know, would you work better off of a picture or an idea? And so her response when she saw the picture was, I don't care if you buy this painting or not, I have to paint this picture. It really resonated with her, which is a perfect answer for someone like me, right? Mm -hmm. I like things that are preordained to some degree or they mm -hmm. feel uh, faded. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I, I, I am going to pay you. <laughs> I am going to buy it. Like, that's why I contacted you. And so I got to see, I, I contacted you that day and shared her artwork with you. Mm -hmm. And then I was very intentional. It took a few months for that piece to be finished. I was intentional in that time. I said I lived locally and wanted to pick the piece up from her directly. So I met her for lunch. We talked. Uh, I'm infectious. I can't help it. <laughs> and uh, she... We became friends. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I can also say, too, just as a side note, that for you to spend money on art like that was also new to you that was an investment that was something that it um, seemed crazy yeah honestly yeah. and it was you beginning to be become the jesse that you are now well and it's interesting because i went to you and said am i nuts for doing this for mm -hmm. wanting to to pay this kind of money to have someone draw you know to finger paint on <laughs> a canvas <laughs> and so um and you encouraged me 100%. You mm -hmm. said you would do it in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And so that's the thing about Iris that Iris is a perfect guest for us mm -hmm. because it shows you and I and where we align. Right? Yeah. And we're passionate yeah. about art. And we're passionate about people like Iris mm -hmm. who follow their passion to such a high degree that profits follow them. Yep. And that's really what this interview is about, is finding someone who knew from a very young age what she wanted to do, yep. and then being so committed to doing it that she can't help but become successful. Mm -hmm. And so Iris, again, go Google her, 
if you don't do anything else, Google Iris Scott. Mm-hmm. Um, she's been featured on Reddit several times. She has a um, video of her creating her art that's gone viral. Mm-hmm. I'm sure it has millions of views. Mm-hmm. And um, she was featured in Forbes magazine. And she did a painting of Hillary Clinton for her campaign. She's really a rising star. Yeah. And we're honored and blessed to have had the chance to speak with her. And so I would encourage you to look through her artwork and look at her prints. And as you listen to us interview Iris and talk about her business, her passion. And I promise you that they'll, you'll be able to take something out of this and apply it either to your business or to your life. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear people come back with what they get out of it because there are a lot of parallels between what we've done in business and what we experience and what Iris experiences. And we asked her some of those things like um, the obstacles that she's had to go up against and what she does to get through those obstacles, self-doubt, all those things that we experience. Absolutely. You'll find a lot of parallels. So settle in, listen to our interview with Iris Scott, and uh, we'll hit you on the backside. Oh, geez, that sounded (laughs) terrible. (laughs) Hit you on the backside? Oh, my God. How about we'll hit you on the phone? Jeez, Jesse. All right, everybody. uh, Jesse Moore here with Margaret Smith. And today we have a special guest. Yes, we are super excited to talk with Iris Scott and introduce those of you that may not know her work um, to her and what she does and a little bit about her story. And we're going to tell you a little bit more about why uh, Jesse and I... Why this guy wanted to interview her. And you might hear some background noises because this is our first time we've had a guest on and we're using Skype. So, And I live in this heart of Brooklyn, so it's <laughs> loud here. Yeah, how come that sounded like a jetliner? Um, it was a motorcyclist that went by, the, by my house just now. Yeah, that's normal. It's actually quiet right now. Nice. Wow. I didn't think motor. I didn't think. I thought traffic was so bad. Motorcycles couldn't move that fast. Um. Well, it's past <laughs> rush hour. Okay. It's like me growing up in Montana, and everybody thinks I rode a horse to school. So, <laughs> right? Didn't you? <laughs> well, you grew up uh, in the country, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I grew up uh, outside of Seattle in a town called Maple Valley. Um, and only had one stoplight at the time. Now it looks like something out of LA from all the development. But um, yeah, I was raised by two hippies, two creative hippies, cabinet maker and a piano teacher. And we lived down a long driveway and we had a lot of time to spend with our own mind and without devices and without a lot of toys, and a lot of outdoors. So that I'm, it sounds like you consider those those features formative to your development? I think so. I I think it was really important to just be left on your own to entertain yourself. I think kids need that. You know, go play, get away from me, go entertain yourself, make something up, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, my childhood was much the same. Like, get outside um, my parents didn't know where I was for hours at a time. Yeah. And yeah. I had I had imaginary friends. I'm not too proud to admit it. <laughs> That's cool. I wish I did. I don't have yeah. enough supernatural experiences. You didn't have mm-hmm. any imaginary friends when you were little? No, no. I had a sister and a lot of dogs, so I just didn't I just didn't have that. But I really I really wish I would have. I think that's cool. So what was your first encounter with being an artist? Well, I had a drive to practice. I would not say I had an innate skill at any point. I don't even really believe in innate, in innate skills. But I, I, did, I did come out of that womb almost obsessed with practicing art. And so I, at 10 and 11, would ask my mom to please drop me off at the library so I could go through all the how to draw books and how to paint books. And... Um, once I started practicing, I noticed that I was performing a little bit better than my same age peers. And then in third, second and third grade, I started getting labeled as a class artist. And then once I had that label, I was like, oh, it's, it's preordained. I must do it then. 
Um, but looking back, I realized that that was just a label that helped me stay motivated. It wasn't actually a truth of some sort, like a, there was not a God-given talent of any sort. Like people try to say there is. I, I don't believe that. It wasn't, uh, you didn't come across a burning bush of artistry and no, and, uh, no one laid a scepter to each side of your shoulders and deemed nope. you an artist? <laughs> nope. No talking cats. Nothing of that sort. So after high school, did you go to college? What was the next step for you? I your- knew that there, I mean, I had been told so many times there was no money in art, so don't bother making that a com- career. So I said, okay, I'd like to be a fourth grade teacher. That sounds fun. So I studied to be a fourth grade teacher. And I also did a four year, since I did a master's in teaching, I could do a four-year in anything, so I chose to do a four-year degree in fine art painting. So um, after college, I went to, well, after, after I finished my master's in teaching, I took a year off and lived in Taiwan. And that is when a lot of magic happened in the story. Yeah, so I happen, uh, I'll interject now for a second and just mm-hmm. say... My introduction to Iris, I had moved into a new home with lots of blank walls and I had decided in my brain for whatever reason that I wanted to feature work by an original work by a local artist. And I probably hunted for six to nine months when I tripped across your work and your work was interesting to me because, and I, I know that it's interesting to a lot of people, including Redditors. Uh, I know that your story has been, haven't you hit the top of Reddit even with the... Yeah, I hit the top of Reddit before I knew what, that Reddit existed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't really follow Reddit, although I've seen it a few times. It's very cool. Yeah, I've gone to the front page of Reddit three times and in the second position once. And so tell people that story of what happened in Taiwan that kind of changed everything for you. Well, in Taiwan, I was living on a shoestring, but I did not have a nine to five job. So I was in a position to not work, really. I was doing a little bit of teaching English, but so minuscule, it doesn't really count. And at that point, I geared up with a bunch of oil paints. I just sat up in my little Taiwanese studio and began painting seven days a week. And it's amazing what can happen when you paint seven days a week. So I started to improve. And at that time, I was painting with brushes, as I had been since, you know, I was a kid. And I had oils. And then something kind of magical happened, which is, I ran out of clean brushes and was too lazy to clean them and thought, oh, I'll just finish off this one painting of yellow flowers and with my fingertips. And I looked at what I had done with the texture of that yellow paint. And I thought, hmm, that's pretty cool. I wonder what would happen if I just focused on that, if I just worked within that limitation. And so then and there, I decided to just finger paint and leave the brushes behind. And nine years later, I'm in New York City, still finger painting. And it's been, inc- it's been incredible. And it's really helped to set a limitation and work within a limitation because there is advantages in a limitation. What are those advantages? Well, in the same way that If you were to decide one day that you're going to only paint with credit cards, you would have a look immediately with your paintings. They would look different than paintings made with a brush. So as long as you've had the fundamental painting skills of the ability to paint realistically, there's only, you could kind of pull off anything, but it would have a certain degree of error because of the limitation of the tool. So my limitation in my tool was finger painting. I couldn't paint details, so I had to paint things a little larger. I noticed that it was really good at texture, so I focused on texture. And 
I went where it took me. I focused on what it was good at. I let it kind of lead the way. So I have to, um, occasionally I'm going to have to tie this into our audience a little bit, which is, and something mm -hmm. you just said kind of reminded yeah. me of something that we, I try to tell people all the time. So you talked about how being able to draw uh, realistically mm -hmm. was most important. And then, and then after that's accomplished, then you can deviate, right? Yes. Yeah. So I tell people in sales <laughs> that they have to follow the script word for word. Once they've mastered it, then they can deviate. Then they can yeah. make it their own. Mm -hmm. What is it that's so important about that method as far as being able to draw in your in your world being able to draw realistically first and then being able to de to deviate why do you think that's a natural progression well i i it seems counterintuitive because when you go to art museums you may notice that there's very little realism on the walls so it seems incorrect for me to say that oh, realism is very important and very necessary. But in the case of Picasso, which is one of the most famous reduction type artists where he minimized until he had almost just a few lines of shapes, um, he could draw like Da Vinci. I mean, he, you should see his old work. It's amazing. There's yeah, I've nothing, seen- there's Nothing he can't I, do. Like hyper-realistic. Hyper-realistic, right? right? So, but what happens is, um, in, you know, people that don't know that, they come in, they look at the minimalism, you know, the express, abstract expressionism that he did, and they think, oh, well, I can do that. I'm going to just start there. But it really misses the point, um, and it's not, it's not really historically correct to think that that's the way it works. So in the same, like for music, for example, Adele right? She has her own sound, but she um, grew up copying all of the masters. She sang the covers of everyone she listened to. And she absorbed and she absorbed and she mimicked and she mimicked until one day she started to change, the, to make her own rules yeah. and to make her own designs. And she had the tools. The same thing is true with like a pianist. If you know where all the notes are and, the, and you can copy the sheet music perfectly and you can copy the covers, then when the time comes when you hear a tune in your head from the ether, you actually have the language skills to put it down, pull it out of 4D and bring it down onto 2D paper. So after finger painting on accident, uh, how quickly did you throw away your brushes? Right away. And right so away. right away, that was your style. That was your format. Right. Because I was like, I do like doing this. This is actually really fun. So I'm going to, I'm going to work inside this limitation for some time. And I figured it'd be around 10 years and we'll see. You know, maybe I'll stop tomorrow. Maybe I'll stop never. But right now it's still very interesting to paint with just my fingers. So I have a, I have a thought, but I'm curious what your take is. Why do you think mm -hmm. people, what is it about finger painting that seems to resonate with so many people? When I show people your work and I tell them how you create it, it creates a dynamic, this awe and wonder. It almost... <laughs> It's so interesting to watch and to see. What do you think it is about finger painting specifically that grabs people? I don't know. Maybe it seems like it's so expected to be bad that it's like painting is already hard. So if you have to do it without a brush, it's sort of like a double whammy. So maybe that's it. I, I always wonder exactly how much it's the images that are landing or as if it's how they're made I still can't quite figure that out I think with your work I think it's the layers that I think I think what people might take until they see your work up close is just how 
much depth there is to your work and and how you I know you're thinking with the end in mind. It's kind of mm-hmm. like um I don't know. It's one of those I think there's a lot of awe and wonder with your work because when I see it up close because you're you're creating colors and layers and depth to your work that I can't see until you get to the very end. Like I can't see how it ties together until the very end. Oh. Right. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Right. Well, I paint from photographs um, and life. Last night, I had my friend Jean Marie sit on my sofa from 6 p.m. to midnight, and I drew her from life. And it's so much more dynamic and interesting than painting from photographs. But it's really, um, it's kind of a difficult resource to get people to hold still like that. And so I strongly recommend painting from photos as much as you want. Mm-hmm. And never painting from life if you choose they're both great there's there's um i use digital planning in photoshop to collage ideas together i'll chop up i might chop up um two photographs i've taken plus a piece of a painting i've done plus a piece of a master painting and sort of mush it all together into one thing digitally and then paint that it doesn't just come out of the ether for the most part. That's a more advanced move that I'll only be able to start doing in the next decade. All right, so I want to cover just a little bit more history so we can establish a baseline and then I want to get into some meteor questions. Okay. Um, after after finger painting, then there seems to be a progression, another happy accident, which is um, painting animals, painting dogs specifically. Mm-hmm. So right. how, did, how did that come into being? Well, I noticed that finger painting was really good at dots, <laughs> you know? <laughs> that makes sense. So I looked around, I thought, what's, what's made of dots? What can I paint that's made of dots? Okay, okay, and I was on a canoe trip, and the dog shook off, and I was like, there it is. I'll focus on that for a while. And it landed really well with the audience. I enjoyed doing it, and when you have that combination, you focus on it for a period. And so about 20 shaking dogs later, um, that brings us to now. And I am starting to move away from those just because they've sort of run their course. But it, it, was, it was a nice, iconic sort of mass appeal image that definitely helped with things like Reddit and various free advertising The horns in the background. I, I feel like I'm in New York right now. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you are. This is seriously so quiet right now. <laughs> so, Iris, at what point did you realize that this was going to be far greater than your expectations? Like, you had been oh. told, at, when you had been told at a young age that there was no money in art, at, at some point you had to realize that not only was this going to be profitable for you, but that this could provide you a life beyond your expectations right yeah I didn't think I'd be in Forbes at the age of 34 for being a painter you know but um the truth is is when I was in Taiwan at uh, and living on basically seven thousand dollars a year if not less and selling paintings for a hundred bucks and paying rent that was a hundred bucks and making quite a profit right away because my cost of living was so low. It was actually at that point, right away, right in the beginning, where I was like, oh, all I have to do is live in Asia in order to be a painter. I think I can commit to that. You know, I'll find a way to make that great. Because it was just important to paint every day. And I felt like I was living like a queen at that time. I really realized that the funny thing is actually a psychic told me that I was going to make a boatload in, uh, of money in art um, way before I sold a painting, which is weird. Uh-huh. And uh, she also told me that my, that my dad had um, a, something very wrong with his stomach. And I was like, what are you talking about? He, he did end up having kidney cancer, which he removed and was fine. But it was just a very accurate reading that day. 
but the question was, when did I really realize that it was going places? And I, I think, I feel like it's when I moved out of my mom's basement and moved into my own house in Seattle. That's when I realized I could be a grown up and be a painter. Mm-hmm. And that's when the paintings were around 2000 a piece. You know, that's when I was like, I think I've got this. I think this is going to work. This feels like there's momentum here and it seems sustainable. And just to give our audience some perspective, how much are your uh, original art pieces selling for now? Well, they're bigger than they used to be, but um, we're selling... We're selling pretty easily in the twenty-five to thirty-five thousand range now. I just—I wish I had more to sell right now. <laughs> <laughs> bigger though, you know, those are bigger paintings. Yeah, so, the ones I was selling for two thousand, but still. And that's an interesting aspect to your too. Now that you're going large format, you've had to change your systems, your process of painting. I would imagine. Yeah. I remember first meeting you and you would have to paint all of, you would have to paint most of the painting all in one day. Right. Sometimes sometimes you could break it up into two days if the color mm-hmm. pattern would allow, but because mm-hmm. of the way the paint dried, you had to you had to basically commit to painting a day. Yeah. You and can't that was that. great. That limitation was awesome at the time. That made me work well into the night when I wanted to stop. It made me focus harder because I didn't have the luxury of pausing. So again, the obstacle had been the advantage. And um, when I really, really needed to go bigger and paint larger, I slowly with baby steps and trial and error figured out how to do it. And it basically meant that I had to finish. I had to be kind of like a human printer. I have to know what I'm doing exactly before I start. And I have to finish whatever I paint and sort of just have one edge that's still active the next day. Whereas I don't go back and paint what was painted the day before. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense to me. But I've seen your work and I know Mm -hmm. how. Okay. You even had to, though, don't you, correct me if I'm wrong, but with the large format, are you painting vertically? Are you painting with the canvas on the ground? How are you painting that? Oh, I paint predominantly vertically. Uh, sometimes okay. I lay it on the ground, thin the paint, fling, thin the paint at it. But that's more of an exception than a rule. And so now, how long does it take you to paint a large, your, your current works, which are much larger? It's averaging about two weeks. Wow. Well, no wonder it's Including the planning time. Yeah. Well, they should definitely. It, I'm talk. actually making quite a bit less money per hour and per day, but it's just so much more fun to do it this way. It's more stimulating. All right, so now I'm going to get into some deeper questions in regards to your work and your okay. business. So, I've seen in your work recently, you are kind of deviating from finger painting a little bit. Mm -hmm. Right now, so I guess my question then is, do you ever doubt yourself when you have an idea artistically to go away from what you've been doing and to deviate and change? Is it, have you learned to trust your instinct or do you ever doubt yourself? Um, I doubt myself constantly. Um, but I do a lot of self talk, a lot of brainwashing to like a coach would like since I don't have a coach so I just sort of repeat stuff to myself until I start to believe it like today I was talking to Iris in the third person (laughs) and being like out loud in fact in the studio so it's really weird that you'd ask me that today Mm -hmm. Um, and I was like are you having fun with this painting Mm -hmm. yes are you learning something for the next painting? Yes. Is it possible that it won't be perfect? 
yes. Is that okay? In the scheme of your whole entire lifetime, does that really make it that big of a difference? No. And yeah, so that seems really dorky, but it's true. I did that earlier today around three o'clock. Mm-hmm. Are you, so when you start to experiment with new things, is that because you just have a desire for new things or are you tiring of the old ways? Are you t- getting tired of finger painting? What drives you to change things up? Um, I wouldn't say I'm tired of finger painting. I'm maybe tired of subjects. Um, the golden carrot is a bit of a ball and chain because it's so tempting to say yes to commissions, but they're not what I would necessarily paint tomorrow. Like I don't agree to commissions unless I'm like, yeah, I would enjoy painting that. But if I were to just be left being like, what is the, what is the greatest painting weirdest subject you could dream up right now? the chances that a person comes in and requests that is just not possible. So um, that's why I'm kind of picky about commissions. I'm saying no a lot just so I can stay passionate. Are you more discerning than you used to be? Or when I asked you to commission a work, were you just as... Um... Oh, I'm, I'm way more discerning than I used to be. Yeah, money gives you that permission mm-hmm. to do that. There is a freedom in that, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't, you know, 10 years ago, I would say yes to anything because at least I was still making money and and learning how to do basic painting, right? But right now, I'm like, okay, I need to spend each day trying to get into a museum, right? And if I'm going to do that, I need to take everything really seriously, Hey, Iris, I remember uh, when we sat in your house that one time and we were able to watch you paint, you had mentioned that you had a jar with random objects in it, I think. And you said that like when you needed to get inspired on a subject, you would pull a slip out of the jar. Yeah. And I was wondering if you still did that or how you keep yourself motivated, inspired. and. Right. Um, I, I do still have that jar. I haven't tapped into it lately, although my mom started her book based on pulling three words out of that jar. I think she pulled Egyptian, snakes, matches, and 50s car. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And she's literally, she's like, she's like two years into writing a novel based on those four words. Um, Wow. So maybe, maybe I had that jar just so she could do it. I don't know. I, I spend so much time in museums and looking at art. I cannot, I can't look at enough of it. If I'm not in a museum looking at art, I'm on Pinterest looking at art. I mean, I'm just constantly um, absorbing it. And it feels more like there's just too many ideas than not enough time. It, there's not really a lack of ideas. Okay. Iris, it's, I'm going to say something that I think a lot of people think. Mm-hmm. It seems you like you were lucky to find your passion at such a young age. Right. Uh, do you continue to, is that, does that continue to lead you? It seems to continue to lead you. And I guess I'm curious if you ever feel like you're not following your passion or you're not on the right course, and then how do you get back to it? So last year I fell off course a bit where I said yes to too many commissions and became enslaved by the work instead of just willy-nilly painting whatever I want and selling it like I had in the previous years. Um, And so I finally have gotten a grip on that. It took me kind of a year to wrangle that in and complete those commissions and increase the sizes of the minimums and to be more picky about what I said yes to so that I would be excited when I actually did start the commission. But from basically the year of 2017 to 2018, I experienced the closest I have to a little bit of depression. I was kind of like, what am I doing? Just a little bit. 
But now, after a lot more meditation and uh, a lot more legal marijuana, I have gotten much more on track to what I really am trying to express as a soul before I die and leave this plane. I am trying to bring into the 2D form of painting, I guess a little bit the 3D form of sculpture. I, I want to depict much more magical, mythological um, subject matter. Something that looks um, kind of ancestral, but also futuristic. And uh, these fe it's female leader type characters. And they're like, I'm working right now on a eight foot, is it eight foot or nine foot, almost nine foot portrait of a invented being. And she's kind of coming out of these, I can't even describe it, but it kind of looks like sparks from a fire. It's really bizarre. And I'm very motivated to make it because I feel like I'm sort of channeling what I would paint if I was a kid. More inventive, mm. more playful, more less decorative, more insane. <laughs> I like that. Why the female aspect, Iris? Well, I think that the way women paint women is, is really under represented in museums and you know they're usually just so sexualized by a male painter and I just I want to paint these sort of towering females so I want to go back to that lack of you know that slight depression that you went through mm -hmm. what, so this idea this new concept do you think that it was necessary for you to go through that to get to this? Yes, yes, I'm really grateful because a valley helps you define um, a mountain. And um, I'm so glad that I had a little bit of pushback from my subconscious because it helped me to find who I might really be. That's funny that you just said that because we're reading this book called atomic habits mm -hmm. we just started it and it's kind of funny because <laughs> we spent a, quite a bit of time talking about this thing he calls the valley of disappointment mm. which is uh when our progress isn't linear mm. or when our progress isn't following the, the uh, speed or timing that we expect mm, yeah but, but how it's absolutely necessary for change. Yes, yes, that's true. It is, you know, consistency is not a human trait. No, it's not. <laughs> All right, so now I'm curious about you as an artist. I'm also curious about you as a business woman. What did mm -hmm. you have to learn about business in order to become a fine artist living in New York City? Well, I didn't start out in New York City. The important thing is that I, in business that I can teach about being an artist is that if you think you're just going to like be good at marketing and become an artist in New York City, it's stacked against you pretty aggressively. I first acclimated to the very bottom tier of, uh, of uh, cost of living, and I did not raise my cost of living until I could absolutely afford it with painting. You know, so no side jobs, no day jobs. It needs, you need to be making, you need to be spending seven days a week painting in the beginning and spending no money on your livings. Now, is there, are there other ways to do it? I'm sure there are. I just don't know anything about that. So I can't really speak to it because I can only speak to what I actually pulled off. But I didn't move to New York and get an apartment that cost this much until I had spent a year in Seattle with a much cheaper apartment, gauging how much I could afford with art to move and having a savings from art. So that's my number one point that I always try to make is it's not about 
your marketing. It's not about how much money you charge. It's not about who you know. It's not about what gallery you're in. It's about bring your cost of living down so low, make your prices so low that everyone buys them, figure out where you are consistently selling, make more, um, constantly try to improve. Don't try to sell big paintings until you've sold a bunch of medium-sized paintings and raise the prices so slowly that nobody seems to notice they're going up. And if you have inventory, your prices are too high. If you've got 10 paintings, your prices are most definitely um, overpriced and you need to discount, shake up some cash and buy more materials and do something a little different. Yeah, and, and I can say that, again, for the audience, for perspective and knowing what you charge per paintings, I know earlier this year you you openly stated you were out of originals, that even at that price point, you're, yeah. you're painting as fast as I can. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. I have two originals right now, which is a, a, I think, a good low amount of inventory. Two is okay. Zero is not good. That's too little. Two to five is okay. If you've got 10, your prices are too high. All right, so you, as you mentioned, you've been featured in Forbes magazine. Uh, you, I'm going to try to cover this quickly and mm-hmm. as accurately as possible. But sure. You may have to correct me. So featured in Forbes magazine, uh, you were commissioned by the DNC to paint a portrait of Hillary Clinton for her mm-hmm. campaign. I was commissioned by Hillary Pack. Oh, so by not, Hillary Pack. Not quite. Okay. Yeah, that's not quite accurate. Okay. But you were commissioned to paint a portrait of Hillary Clinton for her mm-hmm. campaign. What's uh? What are you proudest of achieving so far? Hmm. I I'm pretty. I think I'm most proud for having a solo show in the Lower East Side last or this past year, and um, having it go so well. And I'm actually really proud of the show that's coming in this coming May 2019 because the plan is to make it so over the top and to do a performance at the show. Um, that's something I'm most proud of, actually, is securing that show. It's hard to get a solo show in New York. It's really hard. Oh. And then, I mean, I had a follow-up question to that, but I think you just answered it, which was, what do you have to look forward to achieving next? Is there something? Well, there's that show. The May show is really cool because I um, have something very special planned that I can't wait to share, but I'm going to keep a secret. Um, But then in June or July, I'm packing up my studio and my life, and I'm moving to New Mexico because I just bought uh, 112 acres out there. 112. (laughs) (laughs) Is there something specific about that number that we should hang on to? 12 is a lucky number. Uh, Okay. (laughs) And is that, what's the point of the acreage? Is that for you to roam nomadically or? Yeah, that's exactly why. Just to have no neighbors and to be very much off the grid and go solar and, um, just for as far as you can see, have uh, a landscape that looks like something out of Westworld. I would like have the tune for that show, but I can't remember it. I like how, <laughs> I like how you bought 112 acres to walk around. That's what money can do. <laughs> well, I mean, I will build. I'll build a studio there and a house. There won't be just walking around. And I can't imagine Iris building a typical studio or house. So what's that going to look like? Well, I'm dating a wizard. Um, his name is Sasha. And uh, <laughs> we've agreed to make or to build a small hacienda with a wizard tower out of Adobe. So that I'm really looking forward to having a courtyard and a kind of medieval influenced home. Wow, that's cool. And that uh, brings me to my next question, which is... <laughs> um, you and I, we have an interesting relationship, and that's primarily because I've pushed boundaries as far as, like, being intentional about meeting you, being intentional about 
ordering a painting from you, being intentional about having lunch with you to get that painting. Right. And then, yeah, you're really a special collector. <laughs> Very <laughs> what unusual. What do you mean by that? You're just, they don't usually do that. You're kind of, you're out of the box, even as a collector. Yeah, so I was going to say that what's interesting, like I asked you, and you had no idea who this person was, but I said, hey, will you come talk to uh, this friend of mine that I want you to meet and tour her treehouse? And that was Susan Scott, author yeah. of Fierce Conversation. So without knowing who that person was or really knowing why I was asking you to do it, you said yes. In addition to that, uh, we met kind of on a fluke in Santorini where I asked you if you wanted to go in on a private yacht tour and you said yes. Yeah, uh, with my mom. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So what's your philosophy about that that keeps you saying yes to things? Oh, I guess it's just FOMO. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's worked out for you. It seems to have worked out for you, so. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I if I can, I'll, I would like to try something new. If it's a little scary, it sounds fun. <laughs> I like that. Uh, I have a random question for you. You mentioned earlier yes, that, <laughs> that you don't have a coach. Do you have mentors, though? And how have you, have you sought out mentors? I don't have any mentors, but my mom has, my mom gives really good advice. Yeah. She's kind of my therapist. I really enjoyed She's when great. I had the chance to meet with her, when I picked up a print that you had given us for a mm. fundraiser here at the office and I had a chance to chat with her. Um, I think, yeah, I agree with you. I think she reminded me in some ways of my mom, um, just in that she definitely wants the best for you and has a lot, like, wanted your creativity to flourish from the very beginning, it seems like. Oh yeah, she she completely believes in me. Yeah. I can I can say to my mom something as insane as, "Mom, mm -hmm. I'm going to make a million dollars next year, and I think I could be the next best artist, maybe the next Picasso." And she goes, "Yes, definitely. I 100% believe that." And then she starts <laughs> talking to me about the things she'd like us to buy. <laughs> you know, so and she's not kidding at all. Like she 100% yeah. believes me. And I don't know, it's just, it's just wonderful having someone in my life that I can say insane things to. Do you think, is that something from the very beginning that has helped you, you think, without even knowing it maybe, or maybe you did know yeah. it that, yeah. 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 I thought it was normal. Yeah. And I started, then I started hearing stories about, stories about other people's moms and I was like, oh, this <laughs> is not normal. Yeah. No, it's not. I can speak to that. It is not normal. You and, <laughs> <laughs> you and Margaret, I, I didn't think of that parallel before, but I know both of your mothers, and uh, they are very similar in yeah. that regard. It's almost yeah. as if you guys, I mean, I, it's just crazy to me how you guys basically had total freedom to become whatever you wanted to be and be yeah. truly supported in that. Yeah, and it goes both ways. My mom is now uh, a writer. She started becoming a writer at the age of, like, 61 here in my apartment. She just started, mm -hmm. and I encourage her to do that, and I believe 100% in her. I just I, can't copy her behavior. I can see that, too. It, I can see her renaissance through yeah. in the last few years as as you've been building your career like it. Yeah, ben I mean, for sure, women, especially after the kids are all gone and grown up, they have to kind of birth a huge creation. They're so creative. Their creative energy is overflowing. It has to get channeled or they're going to become unhappy. So it's, just, it's, it's survival. It's essential. All right, so back to business for a second. You had mentioned... Mm -hmm to me recently that you did hire an assistant in the last year yeah and what predicated that necessity sanity I was just driving myself crazy <laughs> you know I would try to paint I was lucky if I got one day of painting in because uh just checking emails and resizing images and 
following up on this question and fixing this problem in the print shop and, you know, whatever. It just took so long. And I was like, man, I need to, I just need to pay someone to do this. So I found, I found someone that's amazing who um, not only figures out how to do everything, even if she doesn't know how to do it, she figures it out. And then she um, documents how she figured it out, what it is, and sort of organizes a protocol of all the little annoying details of Iris Scott Fine Art. So how has that changed your day to day? Oh, it's made it amazing. It's so much fun to get an e email and just click forward. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> it's amazing. It's so amazing. It just feels so good because if it really needs my attention, she'll loop me back in and explain why I need to be in this one. It's just, it's so freeing. I've been spending almost all my time painting and designing and cooking. Like that's what I do now. That and I can, awesome. I'm so much happier. And, Wait. and someday she'll, you won't get email at all and she'll just get it all and you'll hear about it. Oh, she does. I mean, she does. Yeah. All the emails are currently for, sending forwarded to her, but I do have a private email and sometimes things get to that, that I can still forward. So it's just really great. It's just so worth the money. How did you find her? She's my very good friend. She oh. got laid off and I was like, Hmm, this could be a fabulous opportunity. So I pitched it to her and uh, it's been great. We've, it's just been wonderful. There's been no issue with us being friends and doing it because she can, like if I have to be a little bit of a brat, you know, she understands that I have the Iris Scott fine art hat on. I'm not Iris, her friend right now. I'm a different person altogether that just is communicating a need or something I'm not okay with. And she never holds it against me. She never gets weird with me when it's time for us to go out to dinner and just be friends with our group of friends. She's, she's perfect. She's really perfect for this. And then how do you show her that she's appreciated? And, you know, how do you keep her around, I guess? How do you, how do you make sure that you're not trading someone new six months from now? Well, I remind her all the time that um, if she needs to leave for any reason, like go on to bigger, better things, I will completely understand and that she doesn't have to um, keep it a secret because I'm almost expecting her to leave at any time. Um, I'm also complimenting her every day, several times a day, and when I introduce her to new people, I always explain to them that she's also my employee and how lucky I am. Does she have the opportunity to <clears throat> go to events or get behind doors that she maybe might not otherwise have access to with you? Um, not that I can really think of. One of the things Margaret and I talk about is kind of having shared experiences as, mm -hmm. as far as growth goes. And so the point where Margaret is almost like my notebook rather than me scribing or taking notes. Right. And I make her a part of the process. Right. And that seems to be more effective for us overall. Oh, yes. I, I kind of see what you're getting at. Mm -hmm. um, so Susan is... Um, a graphic designer by trade. And so rather than just giving her all the jobs I would have done, we dream of jobs. I actually have her pitch me jobs that she'd like to do that are in her gift set, which would benefit my business. So for example, she's designing a coffee table book. She designs various, you know, postcards and pamphlets and advertising things. And certainly she's really good at social media. And I let her run with that. All right. And then it seems appropriate as we wrap this up with you. Um, I know that uh, I know what your passion is to a, a pretty high degree. And I think <laughs> it seems like that was best 
illustrated in you publishing a book recently. Mm -hmm. Is that still your purpose and passion as far as? Yes. Yes. I'm still working on that, how to draw and how to paint, how to market trilogy. And I'm making really good progress on that. Can you tell our audience what that is and what that looks like and why you're doing it? Well, um, I have never found a how to draw book that made any sense. And, uh, I think that they're written completely backwards and have way too much information and they're not that helpful and they're really outdated. They're they're basically, they're terrible. That's why hardly anyone can draw. So I am, I studied artistic development when I was getting my master's for two and a half years, every research study I could find. And it's just, um, it's, it's just made me more and more sure that the way I taught myself how to draw is actually extremely simple and, um, and anyone can learn this. So I've paired up with a fourth grade teacher, friend of mine, and I'm teaching her from, she can, she cannot draw. I'm teaching her how to draw, how to paint, and then how to market. And then through that process, we're, we're transcribing an entire book around her transformation. So as I teach it, we're learning about how it is, we're actually learning how it's learned because she has the uh, excellent mind for this. And so is this, how would this compare, how would your method compare to the uh, draw circle? Ugh. How, uh, how do you learn how to draw? Um, it completely throws that out the window because it doesn't work. And it offers some really straightforward, simple um, skills, which are just repeated and built upon. And just it's like an accelerated version of, I went through so many stupid techniques to try to learn how to draw. And now, in hindsight, I realize how small of a lesson I actually needed to do everything. And so I'm just paring it down into its absolute barest bones. And that's the, that's the foundation of this pedagogy. And where the, how do you feel about Bob Ross? I think Bob Ross is a, a, tr- a national treasure. That's the correct answer. <laughs> I think he's wonderful. And he, you know, he just shows how innate... Um, it is to be a, it, how innate it is to just love to paint. It is for a human being to the point where we can just watch it on television and be completely mesmerized. You know, imagine if you were doing it, how mesmerizing that would be. Well, it, it's, it's possible to learn. Is that it your starts cha- with drawing realistically. Is that your challenge then is imagine how peaceful it would be if you did it instead of watching it? Yeah, definitely. All right. <laughs> um, so I, if somebody like wanted that. to, if somebody wanted to check out your work, where would you recommend they go first? The best place to just be, just Google Iris Scott, and that'll bring you straight to my website, Iris Scott Fine Art. Okay. And is there anything that our audience or Jesse and I can do past this podcast uh, to help you in your mission? Hmm. <laughs> How deep is your bank account? <laughs> <laughs> it's going I'm to be really kidding. deep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I'll think about it and I'll let you know. That's such a okay. great question and I, I should think about that. Okay. Well, Iris, we appreciate it. Thanks for uh, taking the time to talk to us. We love you and we love your work and I think you know I this. I love you. But we just wanted more people to have an opp- opportunity to see your work and hear how you think. And um, thanks for taking the time. It was really a pleasure. Good night to you both. So, Margaret, what did you think of our interview with Iris? I loved it. I thought there were some really good points that came out, some themes. And uh, I just really enjoy her as a person. And it really made me, I think I mentioned to you after that interview, I love her confidence as a businesswoman, not just as an artist, but as a businesswoman. And it's definitely something I want to grow into more myself. So, 
Yeah, I think it's an interview about mastery. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I think uh, people should get ready when they see us interview someone. I, what I want them to know is that we're not going to be. We might interview your mom. You know, we might mm-hmm. interview people that we care about, but. Honestly, it's going to be about mastery Mm -hmm. because that's what we we love, Tales of Mastery. Mm -hmm. And so to hear her talk about doing a painting a day to going from small format paintings to medium to big paintings. Yep. And then even to how she prices paintings, Mm -hmm. um, all of that was mastery over time. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, she said repeatedly, practice, practice, practice is what her parents always said to her growing up. And it's very much like what we talk about in real estate. You should be practicing scripts. You should be practicing what you do every single day. And as an artist, she's been doing that for years. Yeah, we've had the benefit of having many conversations with Iris, uh, even philosophical conversations like talking about um, Malcolm Gladwell Mm -hmm. and the 10,000 hours. She, What's great about Iris is she believes anyone can do anything. Yep. That nothing is innate or talent, Mm -hmm. but it's due to practice and hard work. Mm -hmm. And that's her passion. Yeah, I loved how she dived into the foundation that an artist has to have, like Picasso. She mentioned Picasso. Because when I was working at the museum, the Seattle Art Museum, we'd have people come in all the time and they'd be like, oh, I can do that. You know, I can draw like that. I can do this. They Mm -hmm. can do that. Just putting aside the hours and years and uh, months of work that people put into the foundation of drawing before they really become um, what you see on the walls. And so I love that she dug into that. I love that she dug into the obstacle is the advantage. So thinking about the obstacles that we've been through in business and how those do really make us better people, better business people, uh, make the business bigger and better. And I loved those specific pieces that I thought paralleled so well. Yeah, and it was neat to hear her talk about her uh, moment of depression, a moment where things weren't going the way that she wanted, mm-hmm. and then how she got through that time period mm-hmm. and how she has – you know, gratitude for that time period because it f- forced her to think about things differently and do things differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just a really interesting lady at 34 years old to have done, accomplished what she's accomplished. Um, it's huge. So she's, she was, I think she, I don't think we could have picked a better first guest for our podcast. Yeah, she's, well, and she's, um, she's so giving of herself, mm-hmm. which is awesome. We have, we used to, you know, I was very, I've been very forward with her. Like I said, I've been very intentional and, uh, I've been intentional on getting my friends to know her as well. You, Mm -hmm. others. And, uh, we used to go to her house and drink wine and play music while she painted. Mm -hmm. And it's just unbelievable to see her work and to see how far she's come. Mm -hmm. And, and I see it. Again, my amazement comes from the fact that she she would do this if she got paid nothing. Yeah. And she would do it because it's in her – it's inside of her that mm-hmm. she has to do this. Mm-hmm. And so you and I love creative people. Mm-hmm. We love artists. And so I think it is kind of perfect that we had someone that's an artist as mm-hmm. our first interview. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of the other things that really stuck out to me was her self-talk, the fact that she talked to herself in the third person just that morning, actually, when we interviewed her, um, just reaffirming that we all feel doubt. We all have moments when we're not feeling like at the top of our flow or like everything's going our way. And she said she doubts herself every single day, all the time. And it's just a constant, constant reaffirming of that she's doing what she's supposed to be doing, that she's having fun, that she's enjoying herself. Yeah, and really such an interesting timeline to think about her living in her mom's basement Mm -hmm. as literally a starving artist Mm -hmm. and how she goes from being a starving artist to an artist with an apartment to Mm -hmm. in seattle to moving to new york to become a world famous artist Mm -hmm. and now (laughs) buying a 112 acre retreat in new mexico Mm -hmm. to live in whatever kind of house that she i mean really a life by design totally she and I and I I know people 
when you you heard me laugh about the acreage, what you didn't understand is in my head, I knew why she bought that. <laughs> I knew why she bought 112 acres. And it's silly. It's interesting to me because I grew up on a ranch of 40,000 acres, and I know why we had 40,000 acres. We needed that much to feed cows and to water cows and because it's a barren, dry landscape. <laughs> so you had to have more acres to ha- to have a good business. And – I knew Iris wasn't buying acreage for cows. <laughs> Iris was buying acreage so that she could wander mm-hmm. on foot through the desert <laughs> and look at cactus and look at flowers and look at nature yeah. because that that's what inspires her. Yeah. I'm super curious to see what kind of art comes out of her after she's started living there <coughs> in the next year. I think we might see some changes. Yeah, and, and that is interesting because her work – was founded in the Northwest here, Pacific Northwest. So you see a lot of, um, oh, the bugs, the streets. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. she has a series of paintings that are like through the raindrops on a windshield. Mm-hmm. And that's a very unique Pacific Northwest perspective. Mm-hmm. And she's going to have a very different perspective coming out of New Mexico. Mm-hmm. Not a lot of raindrops <laughs> in New Mexico. No, not so much. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, it was an honor and a blessing to talk to Iris. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Please mm-hmm. leave a comment um, about what you learned from this episode because I know it's a little bit different for us. And give us your words of encouragement or mm-hmm. critique. Mm-hmm. And check out Iris Scott at irisscottfineart.com or Google Iris Scott. And let us know if you end up buying a print or a painting. Mm-hmm. She has two originals available. If you have, you know, 25 to 35 grand, you want to throw it out. <laughs> I would encourage you, though. I would. I know there's people listening to this that can afford it. Uh-huh. And I would tell you, to, I'd encourage you to buy an original. Buy it now before it keeps creeping up. No, they're going to be. she's only getting bigger. <clears throat> they are going to be worth more. Yeah. I promise. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Margaret. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. Thanks <laughs> for listening.